So here's where we're at now. We're finishing up the full armor of God. If you've missed some of it, here's what you miss. First of all, we put on a belt. And when I say a belt, I mean a girdle. How many guys in here have a girdle on today? Chickens? So, okay, so how many really tight undershirts? Someone accidentally raised their hand in the back right there. I promise you, I, I saw you raise your hand. It's Roy. Everyone knows Roy, right? <laughs> say hi, Roy. Hi. Yeah. So I'll, I'll fill you in on that later if you're a guest here. But so, so the first thing, you almost put on this girdle, this girdle that you hang your other garments off, you hang your swords on, you hang your other equipment off of. But it's truth. It's an absolute truth. We as Christians, we believe in something called an absolute truth because God has a book written for us so we can live the life that we're called to. And guess what? Since he made all of us, it's an owner's manual. That's how you look at the Bible. It's an owner's manual. It tells us how to live the life we're called to. So in order to rightly live the truth out, we have to apply it correctly to our life. So if you apply truth to your life correctly, it's called righteousness. But if that's too churchy of a term for you, it's right living because you have right thinking. But then as we move forward into our future, we need to shod our feet with the gospel of peace. Everyone say shod your feet. Tomorrow morning, as you're getting up, look to your spouse and go, hey, I'll be right down. I have to finish shotting, but you don't ing it. You just shot it. And I know that now that I keep getting corrected. So, so you shot your feet with the gospel of peace because as you move forward in your life, you need to have stability to stand in the middle of the fight and mobility to move when God has called you to something new. And if you have the peace of God in your life, you're able to do that with the shoes that he gives you. And then the final three things is what we're going to cover today. It, it, the first one is you have a choice to pick it up, and it's the shield of faith. The shield of faith that can extinguish all arrows in the enemy because faith is believing what God has told you. So you have this shield of faith, and by the way, it works best when you have other people around you with shields of faith. You can come in, you can interlock them. This was a great illustration. You should go back and watch it online. It's great. You lock in with people next to you, and your faith can be stronger than ever. But then after you have your shield of faith, you also get your helmet of salvation. Now, this one confused me last week. I got tripped up because I was thinking, oh, we can take on and off our salvation when we feel like it. No, this is a little something different like that because there's times where you're thinking isn't the truth that you have on you. So the helmet of salvation is actually of sanctification. It's kind of scrub your mind clean to get you thinking the way you need to be thinking correctly. So every once in a while, is there anybody in here, there's an aspect of your life you don't think right? And you know, I mean, we all know those places in our life where we're just a little dysfunctional the way we should be thinking. But guess what? But God wants to put a helmet on your head to first of all protect you, narrow your gaze to what you're looking at, and help you think correctly. So I'm going to take a deep breath because I feel like I'm going 100 miles an hour. Now it's time for the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what Ephesians tells us now. And when it comes to the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the most important thing, point number one that I have for you is this. Right? Okay, oh, I forgot. Here's the point. Um, the word of God has no power if there's no breath behind your words. The word of God is a voice thing. The word of God is a speech thing. The word of God is inside of you, but here's the important thing. The enemy doesn't know what you're thinking. He knows what you're saying. And it's not being said unless the breath, the essence of who you are as a created being, and the essence of this God-given image inside of you, when the enemy comes to attack, you actually speak out loud against it. Everything else has been defensive up to this point. You're withstanding the attack of your enemy. But now, as you begin to speak, as you begin to say out, guess what? You begin to attack and you begin to move forward. And so when, when you first hear the word sword, I want to go over here and get a sword over that uh, I, I brought from my office because it hangs there all the time. This is a sword of David for two reasons. One, it's my sword, personally, and I'm David. But then this is actually the sword of David, and there's a little star and a menorah to prove it, that that's David. So, so when I first started reading about this, I'm assuming there's this big broad sword that you have to be able to fight the, the woes of the enemy. But if you think about it, most of your issues aren't far away. They're really close to you, aren't they? See, there are prayers, and, and I, I, I don't mean to be offensive, but there are some prayers that I just don't think work. God, I pray that every person that's hungry in the world gets food. That is a wide choice. Everyone in the front row ducked. That was fantastic. So, 
Um, Alice in Wonderland just ran through my head, if anybody cares. Off with their heads, which sounded British, which I don't think they are. So, so the, the thing about this sword, it's meant for like this wielding and just cutting and chopping things down. But the problem is the word sword that we see here in the spirit has nothing to do with the big broad sword with far-reaching things. It's actually a sword that was somewhere between 6 and 18 inches. That's not a knife. Okay. I thought of it between services, and it's been running through my head. I'm like, I will use that at some point. So, and the front row ducked again, you know. So they call me Mr. Jellyfingers. So, uh, so, so it's a close sword, 6 to 18 inches. How many ever remember a, a disciple by the name of Peter? He was in a garden one time and cut off a soldier's ear. Does that? So this most likely was what he was using because if he would have had this, he would have taken off a shoulder. Right? So this is more likely loud every time, and I should have seen it coming. So, so uh, Mekelos was the name of the sword that they would have been using during this time period. So this is more the sword you need to be thinking about because when you're in the fight of your life and there's something that needs to be spoken forth, you're probably not screaming at the enemy that's a mile away but an inch away. And, and the word word here in the Bible, there's actually three words for the word word. Uh, the first one is graphe, which is if any of you guys have a written Bible or your digital Bible, it's the written word. It's what's the, on those pieces of paper. It's our scriptures. But then there's another one called logos, logos. How many have ever heard that word before? So it's associated with a computer program. And so this is, if I could say this, this is the concepts that God is wanting to get through to us. It's the, it's the essence of what he's been saying. But then there's another one called the rhema word. And it's the spoken word. It's the word that comes uttering forth. And so I have a question. If you're in a fight for your life with an enemy that's in close quarters, do you need a wide uh, uh, sword that you're going to start swinging and just go, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? Or, or are you going to run and grab a Bible that's the written and try to thump this unseen enemy on the head. And by the way, when I say un unseen enemy, I I'm talking about the unseen enemy. At the beginning of this uh, armor of salvation, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but the powers and principalities. You mean we're, we fight against Satan? No, probably none of us. We're above his pay, or he's above our pay grade. Okay? But, but I have a question. Is there anybody in here that your family has dealt with the same I issue for generations? Dad had it, grandpa had it, great grandpa had it. And you could say, oh, it's in our DNA. No, it could just be a generational attack from an enemy. Is he really talking about like enemy and demons? I, I have to. Because we just sang about Jesus, 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 and that same Jesus, 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 that we're about to baptize people in a watery grave to have them come back out as new creations in life. That same Jesus told us that there's an enemy out there seeking to kill and destroy us. So I could sit up here and not make this feel weird and go, no, there's no such thing as demons. Then you're going to walk out of here and you're going to get blindsided by an attack that you never saw coming. And it didn't come happen from a friend. It didn't happen from a co-worker. It didn't happen from a relative. It happened from a generational desire that you couldn't put words to and instead of letting the ruah of who you are come out of your mouth with the word and begin cutting the enemy where it hurts the most guess what you will lose your battle so this isn't weird this isn't hokey this isn't make believe or fictional there's times have you ever heard someone say this maybe they were addicted to drugs or or uh, gambling or uh, sex addiction or something like that and you heard someone say this man they are always fighting against their demons why is that the most common way to describe it because it's a battle that we just don't see we don't wrestle with flesh and blood this is these powers and principalities that are here to what kill us but with your sword, with your word, this wasn't meant for you just to start swinging away. They train the soldiers to try to cut at the vital organs. And that's what happens when we allow God's word to come out of our mouth with a specific scripture to attack in a specific thing. When my boys, every, I, just about every night I get this. About three and a half minutes after putting them to bed, one of them comes walking in the bedroom and says this. I had a bad dream. No, you didn't. <laughs> Physically impossible. I had a bad dream. So my wife, because she's not here, right? Yeah, so my wife goes, suck it up, buttercup. Go back to bed. Mama got to get her sleep. 
I'm like, honey, you can't talk like that. And I'm sure that won't make her way back to her. (laughs) Oh, good, we're videoing. So, like, (laughs) and then I step in as a spiritual dad. (laughs) Why'd you have to laugh at that one? That hurt a little bit. (laughs) Come laugh in my face. No. (laughs) I think I just threatened people. Hey, did we take offering yet? I'll pass the bucket. Um, You think I lost my spot. So, when they say, hey, we had a bad dream and we have fear, here's what we say to them. We don't have a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You know what I use? I use the word back to them. And then I do something. We pray. We say, God, we set angels charge around about these boys as they sleep tonight. Why angels? Well, because if the bad ones are demons, the good ones are angels, I prefer to have the good ones in the house. That's just me. Worst case is I'm wrong. We get to heaven and God goes, just kidding. Who cares? I still worship Jesus. So, like... So then we lay hands on, we speak truth over them, we put the word and the sword in the mouth, then we take them back, lay down, and then we'll even do this prayer. Lord, your word says that we can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Have you ever met someone that was going through some stuff, but somehow they had an internal peace? And then you find out they're a Christian, and you go, oh, I understand why you have this peace, because you understand that there's a God higher than your circumstance that you're dealing with. Why? Because you have got, actually, you allowed yourself to get into the logos, which was the word of God, and now in your own life, when you're going through something, you speak the rhema, the spoken word of God, in order to cut that thing to the core. So the sword has to be more than a printed piece of paper next to you. It has to be something that you put inside of you. And by the way, you should do it before the battle starts. If you go, well, can you even prove this biblically? Uh Uh-huh, with Jesus. It's in in, uh, Matthew chapter 4. So here it goes. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1, it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Ta-da! So so let me get this straight so you guys can go to lunch and argue about this later. The Spirit, who's kind of Jesus' co-worker, led him out into a wilderness by himself where Adam and Eve were in a lush garden with a couple and they had this voice of God that just said something to him. Now Jesus is led in, being led into the wilderness in a place by himself of desolation to eventually fast for 40 days only to be tempted by the devil. God would do that to me? Actually, God loves you enough he would allow that for you. Because Jesus, before he started his public ministry, he needed some private victories. And I guarantee I, you, us, there's somebody in this room right now that you need to hear this, and maybe you even watch it on video. you got to get some private victories so you can start your public ministry. And you've been praying for your, your business to take off, but God knows this, that if he adds too much to your business too quickly, it will collapse under the weight of the lack of integrity that's in it. And it'll end up destroying you as the businessman or woman and owner in that place. There's some of you that want to start a ministry and you should hear me sing. You should see me edit. You should see me write. And God knows this, that if he gives that blessing to you right now, your marriage is so weak that it will crumble under the weight of that new thing that you think you're wanting to move into. And you're questioning God, why isn't he allowing it to do in it? It's because you haven't won some private victories yet. But there's something that happens when God allows you to be led into a wilderness place. Has anyone ever gone to a place like this? You feel like you're by yourself. You feel like you're starving to death. You feel abandoned. And in that place, the enemy attacks you. God, why did you let this happen? Because it's to prove to you you're ready. And so if that, if, if that rings true to anybody, can I just hear just an amen? amen? Amen. Okay, so now, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's how logical the Bible is. Would anybody else be hungry after four hours and four days? Okay. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God. Well, wait a second. If you are the son of God, why would he have said it that way? Because just a chapter earlier, Jesus was getting baptized, not in a hot tub like we had. He had open river. And all of a sudden, the heavens opened up, and God from heaven said this, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So God just identify you as the son of God. Now Satan's going to come. He isn't going to try to tell you something that isn't true. Satan's going to try to get you to question what you already think you know. He doesn't just come out and go, God was wrong. That'd be too big of a lie. But did God? And he just tries to tilt it, just a little taint it, just enough. And so now, tempter came and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you're the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And our response is, we can't do that. 
is there anybody in here that I could take you out back, give you a pebble, and you give me a chicken nugget? Like, could I look at this, this sword and go, hmm, I'd really like a Dr. Pepper. Bloop. Oh, go, 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 go. You know, I don't know why Dr. Pepper. I'm actually not a soda drinker, so a, a spark, whatever. Okay, so, like, could I actually take this and turn it to something new? Our response is, we can't do that. Jesus' response is, I can do that. I'm already going to do water into wine. So apparently he had the ability to do that. But what he said to Jesus, which, by the way, this is the first temptation that Adam and Eve failed at, Jesus is about to succeed at, is he goes, when it comes to the lust of my flesh, there are natural desires that we have in our life, but it depends how you're fulfilling them, if it's godly or not. So I can, which, by the way, I'm hungry. It's been 40 days. Daddy needs a cheeseburger, right? Like, I can do this, but the problem is I'm doing it at the expense of proving you wrong and me right, which is not God's will in this place. So unless it comes out of God's mouth for me, I can't do it. So now, here's a natural desire we all have as human beings. And men, I need you to do me a favor. Don't amen here. It'd be very awkward, okay? So all of us... We have sexual desires that want to be satisfied in our life. Okay, good, you didn't. I, I thought for sure one of you would accidentally be like, I haven't been listening the whole time, but yes to that. So, Okay, so the question is, this natural God-given desire that we have that ultimately leads to procreation and generations and things like that, how do you satisfy them, though? Is it being satisfied because you're holding off till marriage in order to be, have one man with one woman and in order to be sexually pure? Have there been times where you have to go look in a mirror before you do something bad, bad and go, you won't die if you wait? Or do you get online or find the next girl that would go out with you and do everything you can to bet her that night? Because to fulfill... That desire, that's a God-given desire for the flesh that you have. Is it that you get into a relationship, but you decide not to marry? Because after all, why buy the milk with the cows for free? Or let's, you know, we got to test drive this car for a while before we actually purchase it. All these different things. In order, instead of living in a covenantal marriage with someone else? Or do you wait until your wedding night in order to bring all the glory to God to say to him that this is what you've commanded for us to do and in the way of holiness, this is what we're choosing because that was uttered out of your mouth. Guess what? You have a natural desire in order to be fleeting that flesh, but if every night you're on the computer watching screen after screen after screen, video after video after video, you're actually having an affair after an affair after an affair after an affair according to the truth that we're supposed to be rightly living by. So here's the thing. You have natural desires in life. You have lust of the flesh, if we can say it this way. But the question is, how are you getting those satisfied? We can talk about gossiping. Uh, We can talk about physical harm to someone else. We can talk about drug usage. It all falls through that. But in uh, Galatians 5 to 16, it says this, I will walk by the Spirit and not by the desires of my flesh. So Satan, test number one, Rather than going, no, Satan, leave me alone, he actually used the spoken word to cut the enemy and stop him. Now, number two thing is we're going to have to worry about the lust of our eyes. Verse number five, it says, The devil took him in the holy city, had him stand on the highest part of the temple. And he said this, If you are the Son of God, so still trying to get Jesus to question who he is, the enemy is going to continue to question, If you're really a Christian, why did you do that? Because we're all screw-ups. That's your answer, okay? Like, I have fallen short for the glory of God. But don't worry. For uh, John three sixteen, For God so loved me, even in my shortcoming, he gave his one and only son. So we have that word. So he said, if you're still the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And then you're going to love this. Then Satan goes, it is written. Oh, Jesus, you know the Bible? So do I. So Satan now quotes, quotes the Bible to him. And he says this. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, and that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus answered him, it's also written, like, I appreciate you quoting that, but now I'm going to quote something correctly. It's also written, do not put your Lord God to the test. And so lust of the eyes, he took him up onto this high place and goes, look at all this awesome things. Don't you covet this. Um, top 10, thou shalt not covet. Like, this is a big one. Like, we should know this one. Don't covet. What is covenant? Me looking at what you have, thinking what you have, I should own. And if I don't own it, God, you withheld something from me. You stingy, old, you, oh my, like, 
That, that is what you're saying. I covet it, and I should have it, but since I don't have it, now I'm going to look upon it with my eyes of lust, desiring to have it for myself. Jesus, come up here and look at all that you have. And by the way, if you really know who God is, you could cast yourself off of here. And because you're the son of God, the angels will cast you up. And Jesus looks at him and goes, actually, I know God so much, I don't have to test him by jumping off. I trust in the word that he's already given me. So Jesus is now standing up there, rather than, which by the way, this was all the inheritance for him. God never wanted to hold anything back from him. You need to hear that. God, I need to hear that for myself. God wants to release the good things in life to you. But he's standing up there, and rather than coveting it, wanting what he couldn't have, he speaks to him, and he just says this. He goes, do not put your Lord God to the test. Which, by the way, if anybody cares, um, the reason why I don't support gambling, and I'm not talking about four buddies sitting around one night, everyone throwing 20 bucks, ha, 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 we're, you know. I'm talking about you having to go to a boat or a casino or something like that. And unless God lands on this specific number, I can't make my mortgage payment. What you're saying is, God, I I'm going to test you if you love me. And if you don't land on my number, you must not love me. We don't, we don't put our God in that type of test. We say to him, God, how will you come through for me? I actually had a pretty big failure in my life uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, our kids, they've been in soccer for a while. But it came to the point just due to how many have ever received a uh, tax bill for your home? Yeah, one showed up this year. Whoa. That banker was way off on their estimate. So, so as we were just looking inside of our family budget, it, bo it boiled down to uh, we didn't have the margin in there to continue playing soccer the way that we have been for my boys. And so my wife and I, this is a wrong thing to do. We'll cover more of it uh, next week in our relationship 101. We never came together and prayed. We went to our separate corners and prayed, thought we heard from God, then came out fighting about which God was more right. So... It didn't work out well for a day, so, but, but that's what was happening. But bottom line was we ended up telling the boys, hey, we can't have you play in soccer. And so my wife sent the email to the club and just said, hey, sorry, at this time we won't be able to do it. Within 10 minutes, the club called us back and said, we can't lose you over money. So the, one of the main guys lost his intern, asked my wife, would you be the intern? I'll send you jobs. You can work from home, get it on the computer, and you should be able to pay off the entire bill way before the end of the year. And we went, wow, God came through. What if we would have went to the boys and said, hey, we can't afford this? Or in one way to say it is we're choosing not to, so we have enough margin in our life. But you, here's what we're going to do. Let's as a family pray and see if God doesn't come through. If I would have handled it like that, within 10 minutes, they would have seen the faithfulness of their God to give them, here's what it is, a desire this isn't a God-given right for them to play soccer. It isn't mandatory in their life. It's a desire they have. But could you imagine if I, as a spiritual leader, instead of just denying them, actually show them that God cares? And this desire, lust of the eyes, if we can use that phrase, that God actually wants to see that come through? I feel like I failed as a spiritual leader at that point. Lesson learned. I'll do it right next time, hopefully. But this time, I didn't use the word against the enemy I use it against my spouse. So here's the thing. If, you don't, if you're not aware of what the lust of your eyes are doing, guess what? You'll start loving the wrong things. And according to 1 John 2.15, it says this, that if you love the things of the world and don't love the way God does, it actually proves you don't have the love of God in you. So that's why I choose to like things and love people. Can't go wrong with that so your priorities stay straight. In verse number eight, the final thing that we want to cover here, the third temptation of Jesus. Again, the devil took him in a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said this, all this I'll give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. This is why we know Jesus is a baseball fan. Three strikes and he's out. Then the God, that's not biblical actually. Uh, and then the... The devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. So the pride of life. The pride of life is when you want to be seen greater than you should be. When you almost demand respect from the world around you and be in an elevated place. 
There's times where, and I'll, I'll just be honest with you, as a pastor, it feels like that happens, and I go, man, I really don't want to do that. That makes me feel dumb. Like, I don't need that special spot. I don't need to do that special thing. But I understand there's other people that like to do those, and so there's always a tearing place of, God, how do you stay humble? But yet, I'm also standing in front of a crowd of people speaking, and so there's this warring that you have to make sure the pride of your life doesn't come up. And so if you would ever feel like you're a stepping stone for someone else, guess what? They were probably dealing with the pride of life. Has anyone ever been in a relationship? You thought you were friends. You thought you were useful till you realized that you were a step to get over you. Have you ever been in a conversation before where you're talking with someone and they have eye contact, but you notice them keep like looking over you, waiting for a more, impor- more important person to walk in? That, that's that pride of life coming up going, wait a second, I thought the greatest lo- no greater love than this to give your life to someone else. And so in this place where we try to elevate ourselves, in this place where we try to raise ourselves up, in this place where we allow pride into our life, here's what we should be able to say. We should be able to pull out this and say, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I don't serve my job. I work at it. I don't, I don't, I don't demand stuff from my family. I give to them. In these places where pride comes up, this is when you have to have the word of God in your life. And by the way, here's a really fun point. You need to put the word of God in your heart and in your mind and in your mouth before you need the word of God. Because if you put it in ahead of time, God will pull it out just in time. But the problem is most of us wait till we're in the middle of the battle and it's great to call on the name Jesus, but there's a chance you need to talk specifically to fear, to shame, to gossip, to doubt, and you need to have those tools ready for you. So here's what we're going to do. A couple lessons that we just need your takeaway for today. The first one is this. Every day put on your armor of salvation. Maybe you need to print this out out of the book of Ephesians. Put it, on, put it on your mirror somewhere. And every day when you wake up, you look at him and go, God, you are truth. Help me to learn truth. And not only that, I'm going to hang my breastplate of righteousness so I rightly live in it. And as I move forward with my life, give me peace. Give me peace that you are with me to fight the battle and become mobile to where I'm going. And in the case that the enemy comes to attack, may my faith, shield of faith hold strong. Why, God? Because I believe the word that you have for me. And in this, any place that I'm not thinking the way your truth tells me to be thinking, I pray I put on the helmet of salvation and ship my thinking and any place that the enemy is really not paying attention to me I'm pulling out a sword and I'm I was gonna say beating his butt I don't know can I say that from the stage it, if not I'll edit it later so like literally I'm gonna forcefully advance with the word of God that I've been hiding in my heart so step number one there's a chance some of you in here today just need to print out this passage hang it somewhere in your house so that every day you mentally Put on the full armor of God because your armor that you've always lived life with isn't working. In your relationships, in your fights, in your battles, too many dings, too many scars. So then you go, okay, so how do I put the word in me? I have two suggestions for you. Now, some of you go, I do the yearly Bible. Personally, I can't do the Bible in a year. Why? At some point, I feel like I'm just reading to get through it. There is no speed reading competition in heaven, okay? It's a knowledge-based thing. Read until you get something, then stop. Think about it. So you can do one of two things. Number one, find a book and keep reading it till you can explain it to someone else. What do you, I mean a book? Go to the New Testament that's after your blank page and before the maps, okay? This is where you got to go. It's somewhere in there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, all that. I would encourage you to do one of the shorter ones. Get in that one book and read it and read it and read it and think about it and think about it and think about it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it until you think you know it. That will do more benefit for you than speed reading through all the Psalms, especially 119. No one gets it. I'll just tell you now. So, so go look it up. It's real thick. So second thing. Second thing, if you need to figure out how to put the word into your mouth in order for the ruah of who you are to breathe forth the written word, the logos word of God, in order for you to have victories in your life. Who needs victory? If you need a victory in here, say amen. Say amen. Okay, so here's how you go get it. You go to this thing. It's fairly new, but you should be able to find it. It's called Google. Heard of that? Not Facebook. He lost a lot of money this past week. So, okay, so unless you're watching now, Mark, we love you. Like, don't block us on Facebook. Like you do that, everyone else. Okay, so, uh, so you go to Google, and you type in Bible scripture about shame, fear, guilt, doubt, worry, gambling, whatever it is. And Google does this amazing thing. 
it finds what other nerdy Christians have put together list of all the scriptures having to do with just that. So there are. There's these great Bible thumpers out there that does this for people like you and I that don't read the Bible too much. And you can go out there and you just start reading through the list and find a scripture that's a perfect battle axe against the thing you're struggling with. Get a Sharpie, a permanent marker, and write it right here on your forearm. And then if it starts bleeding off, switch arms next week because hopefully you're showering. Okay, so, but literally you just download this one scripture and memorize it and memorize it and memorize it. That way in case something like fear comes up, you can go, I don't have a spirit of fear. I have power, love, and a sound mind. It should just roll off your tongue. You know, before, before, uh, before I knew Christ, he died for me. So if you're worrying about your salvation, look up the scripture to know that he died for you way before you ever met him. How can it so easily slip away from you? You know, there's all these tools. So I would say this, number one, everybody in here, if you need to download the scripture, daily put on the full armor of God. Say it over and over and over until you have it memorized and then you start believing it. Number two, get the word in your mouth ahead of time. Either and find a book and read it and read it and read it until you know James. That's a great one. That's one of my favorite ones. Go to James. Just start reading and reading and reading and reading it until you know it inside and out. But if there's one specific place in your life that you're battling on and on and on, and you feel like you're using broad strokes, but use time for some very strategic warfare against it, go find one, two, three scriptures. Memorize them so that when that enemy rears his ugly head, you no longer feel like you're in a defensive posture hoping to hold on one more day. But you can pull out the word, and you know what he'll do? Uh Uh-oh, he studied. Uh Uh-oh, she learned something. And you'll see the enemy just backs up until such time that God comes to feed your soul and nourish you and you feel replenished. Amen? Amen. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to transition here in just a minute for our baptisms. And as we do that, I am going to be asking this one question. I've been talking about Jesus today. I've been talking about full armor of God. But there's some of you in here that goes, listen, I don't know his name. I don't know what all that means, but as you've been talking, my heart's been beating, my mind's been racing, and I actually, I want to know more about that. I want to talk to you in just one second, but first, could I ask every person who's a part of the band, could you make your way back up here, and if you're going to be a part of our baptism in about three minutes from now, could I ask you to make your way right around that sign and the baptismal tank? So if you're getting baptized, if you're someone getting in the tank with the baptizer E, I think that's how you would say it. So it, just make your way that way. And by the way, if you haven't been here for one of our baptism services, we do have a core value called party, and there's a party about to happen because it actually says that all of heaven rejoices when just one person comes to know God. And so uh, I'm ready to rejoice some more today because I believe there's someone around this room that you've been listening to me talk, a friend's been asking you to come to church, you've been questioning God, asking about God. I know there's a lot of people, we get emails all the time, that you are exploring the church through the online service. And we love that you're doing that. But if you're here today and you're going, you know what, I'm tired of the battle that I've been in for a long period of time and my armor is no longer effective. Everything I've tried to do seems to keep coming up as a failure. But inside of my life, I'm ready to be more than a conqueror. I'm ready to be the head and not to t- the tail. I'm ready to be above and not beneath. There's a really good chance today is your day that you will say yes to Jesus Christ and not only eternally be saved, but right now in this finite amount of time, you will be victorious. So I'm going to ask, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? But to take away pressure, not that you think and everyone's looking and I want to respond, but, you know, the person who brought me, they're going to see. Could I just ask everybody just around the room, in order to honor the people that are here, would you mind just closing your eyes, bowing your head? And really what I'm asking you to do is separate yourself. Possibly you're a longtime follower of Christ, and this is a moment in time where you just get to go, God, I love you. I love you for your protections. Possibly you've flirted with God, you've dated with God, and it's time to renew your vows to God. Some places call it rededicating your life. Maybe you're here for the first time, you're watching us, and in your life you're going, no, I need to become a follower of Jesus Christ and say yes to a man who stepped out of eternity onto the earth to live for 33 years perfect 
to be crucified on a Roman cross because his body needed to be broken so that yours wouldn't. His blood needed to be shed because yours would not pay the penalty of death. If you're here today and you say, I want to know this man and wear his armor and live a victorious life, all eyes closed and all the heads bowed, I'm just going to ask you to simply raise your hand in the air. No one's looking except for me. I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise God. I see those hands. There's hands all around this room right now. This is no surprise. You are a part of a church right now that not only sees salvations weekly, but we get testimonies daily. Almost bi-monthly, we're baptizing people. We had six in our first service. We're going to have another ten in this service, maybe more. But if you're watching us online and that tab popped up, please make sure to click that so that we know that you made the decision. And with all the hands that went up around the room, could I ask everyone to say this prayer with me today? Dear Jesus, I am ready for a new battle strategy. Mine has not been working. So I lay down my arms and I pick up your armor. Forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life. And on this day, I choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ. God, I just thank you that we continue to see amazing, amazing results of your spirit moving in people's lives. So we celebrate with those that have said yes to Jesus today, but now we take it a step further and we say this, for anyone in here struggling with this word that's not in your mouth because the lust of your flesh continues to consume you and you give yourself to it, we pray for victory this day. For the lust of your eyes that you're always looking to a future and it's supposed to be brighter and it's supposed to be better and you're never in the moment becoming who you're supposed to, God, we pray for victory in that place. And for the pride of life that would try to exalt ourselves up higher than we should be, God, we pray for humility to be our portion and the words to be in our mouths so that as it's not just a lagos written somewhere, but the ruha of our breath comes forth and the essence of who you are is blended with the words that we say and we find victory.